The scripture reading for today is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, as we continue in our series on uh, what it means to live in the body of Christ, live in the grace of God, live in the power of the Holy Spirit in this world. After going through a long list of blessing and a prayer in chapter 1, where Paul says, I know you have all this grace on you, and I want you to have even more grace and more knowledge about God. Let's remember where you came from and what you were made for. In chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air the Spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in passions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the the world we come out of and the world we are going into are very different places. And as we live now in between, in some ways, help us to understand where it is we came from and where we're going and and what you have made us for right now in this age, in this part of eternity. Help us to be attentive to your spirit this morning. May he move among us and, and guide my words, especially Guide all of our thoughts in this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1984, which was a long time ago, Leslie and I had finished at Penn State and we were going down to Texas to go into seminary. I was going to seminary down there and we moved to the great state of Texas. Let's hear it for Texas. <laughs> That's what they say. That's pretty much the first thing they say as soon as you cross the state line, that there is no better place to be. There is no other country like Texas. Or, or What is the exact phrase? The, the country? It, it's a whole other country or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And it is, it's a great place. We were there for about eight and a half years and really grew to love it. It was a, a really nice, nice time in our lives. Two of our sons were born down there, so we have great fond memories. But anyway, the native Texans are very committed to Texas, and they love Texas. And in fact, I had numerous conversations with the native Texan guys that were there. And uh, it would usually go something like this, where you cannot help, you can't help where you're from. You're from Pennsylvania, sorry to hear that. But you can help where you are right now. And you're in Texas. And that's a good place to be. Paul is going to say something similar here today. You really can't help where you're from, because you were born a certain way. But you really can help where you are right now. You can make a difference in your own life 
about how you're going to live your life, the choices that you're going to make, the motivations that you have, the goals that you have, you can decide where you're going to be, whether you want to move back to Pennsylvania or not, which was the great thing for us. But anyway, anyway. Paul says you came from somewhere. He describes what that old order, that old world, that old kingdom like. And what was it like? Part of it is, part of it was that you were dead even when you were alive. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions, dead in your sins, in which you used to live. He's saying that they were dead and alive at the same time. Now, for some people, this is a little bit hard to see, probably especially for those who are not believers. But, but let me show you some ways where that is. this is really really true, apart from being scriptures, it is what we see in our experience in this world, being dead but being alive. Here are some signs of death or decay, a lack of love, uh, lack of life in our society. Let me ask it this way. In Genesis 1 and 2, there's the Garden of Eden, the perfect world, and then the fall. What occupations would we not have in our society today if we did not have that Genesis 3 fall experience? We would still have teachers, we would still have music directors, and probably pastors, and uh, accountants, and that kind of a thing, but, but would we have police officers? Probably not. Would we have judges? We may have people who are wise people to discern a best course, the wisest course of things, but but you wouldn't have that whole justice system. You wouldn't need any jails. You wouldn't have that whole industry going on. We probably wouldn't need doctors and nurses in the same way that we do now. Can you imagine going to the doctor and the doctor saying, you know, you're in pretty good shape for a 247-year-old. <laughs> you have the body of a 183-year-old. We wouldn't need cancer researchers. We wouldn't need any of that stuff. What a world that would be. But because we have those things, those are signs that we live in a decaying world. Just individually in yourself, you are getting older, right? Right? Many of you can feel it, minute by minute. You're getting older. Unless the Lord comes and raptures you, you're going to die. Your body will wear out. You will die. That is death. That is the lack of of life in you. Even for Christians, that's going to happen. That death is going to happen. Other signs just in Mentally, depression, other mood disorders or disturbances. In a perfect world, we wouldn't, Leslie wouldn't have a job. We wouldn't have mental health therapists and counselors. But spiritually, in a perfect world, you wouldn't have doubt, you wouldn't have anxiety, you wouldn't have any of those issues like that. You wouldn't have any difficulty in your relationships. None whatsoever. There would be no such thing as a marriage counselor, no such thing as a divorce attorney in a perfect world. Selfishness would not be a part of your life or your neighbor's life or your children's life or anything like that. Because what death does, this lack of life, lack of love, this decay in you, what that does and what that does to people and is it makes them very selfish, or selfishness goes along with that. Selfishness is a big part of sin. And so Paul says here in verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its every desire, following every thought. I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. Have you ever had a craving for something? 
Put your hand up if you've ever had a crave. I mean, that just that, ah, oh, got to have that. <laughs> coffee, yeah, you wake up in the morning, you got to have that coffee. Yeah, but Paul says it's not just some of the cravings, which actually uh, we have a desire for love. We have a desire for relationships and people. We are for God. Some of those are good cravings, but these are negative cravings. These are things that do not satisfy ever. For these people, life is the attempt to satisfy a hunger that can never be satisfied with things that will never satisfy. The person who's addicted to drugs will always want more. The person who's addicted to certain foods will always want more if that is filling up some kind of emotional emptiness in them. The person who uses approval from others as the basis for their own self-esteem will never have that satisfied. They will always want more. Checking to see how old the youngest person in the room is. Okay, the person who uses sex to try to satisfy her hunger for love will never be satisfied. The person who uses judgment and anger against others in order to feel good about themselves will never be satisfied. None of the things that people seek after to fill that hole in themselves, none of those things will fill that up. And I do want to ask for a second. Everybody said they had a craving of some kind. What are the cravings that you have? And again, some of them can be healthy. Relationships, craving for hunger for God. That's, those are positive things. But are there negative cravings, negative desires in you that lead you down the wrong path sometimes? It's very important for you to understand those things to understand about that issue in yourself because that feeds that craving. I mean, there's nothing that can satisfy that, but what is it that, that how is that developed in you? Where does that come from? Is there a voice from your past, maybe a parent or child or, or, or sibling or a friend or a teacher somewhere told you something that you believed about yourself and now you're trying to work against that. Just the general nature of sin in the world and in people causes us to be unhealthy, uh, but, but are there specific things that you can identify and say, you know what, I, I have a problem in this area, and I think it's because of this. Sometimes the more you can understand an issue in yourself, the, the more resources you can come up with in yourself or help from others that can help you to deal with some things. So just just wanted to put that out there, even if you are a believer. I'm going to skip in the outline here and go right down to the, the good part of this. Because you don't have to live as a slave to this anymore. You are now a child of God. If you have put your trust in Jesus Christ and, and given him your future and, and he's forgiven you of your sins and now you're that a child or daughter, that, that, that's a great place to be. That's where you really want to be. That's where you really want to live in, the li- in your life. There's a, a new ruler who loves you, is rich in mercy, rich in grace towards you. He's expressed his kindness to you through Christ. And you were made alive even when you were dead. And you're now in Christ. In fact... Paul says here in verse 6 that he has seated us with him. If you are in the body of Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms, Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us through Christ. Did you get that? If you are seated with Christ, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, He's not standing there. He's not not moving around, pacing back and forth, wondering what's going to happen. He is seated. The work of salvation is finished. It is done now. 
And the work of salvation in you is done. You're seated with God already. You're, that's a fixture there. You're, you're relaxing. You're comfortable with God now. You don't have to, to worry about your relationship with God. You are forgiven. You're seated with Christ there. And what does it say one of the purposes of that is? To show you off. That in the coming age, that you will be a trophy for God. God's going to hold you up and say, I saved that person. He's going to show the whole universe. You remember how that person used to be? Remember, remember what Tim was like before I saved him? How bad that was? And I even saved Tim. And you can put your own name in there if you want. But you are going to be a trophy. The prize, the reward, and God's going to show you off. You are saved by grace through faith. Paul says it is by grace that you've been saved. Not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by work so that no one could boast. Cannot go through this passage without giving something that I think, I hope we for. But grace, there's an acronym, the G-R-A-C-E. Who, who knows it? Who can say it? I, I've heard you say it. God's riches at Christ's expense. That it was Jesus Christ who accomplished this. It was not you. By grace you've been saved, and it is not of yourselves. That that is something that God has gifted to you as a blessing that he's given to you. What is the relationship between grace and works? We do not do good works in order to be saved. You cannot build up a mountain high enough of good works that you can stand on it and reach God. That mountain will always be too short. It will always fall down on itself. But God has saved you so that you can do good works in this world. He has saved you. He has cleaned you up. He has made you something new in order to do what's good in this world, to do good things in this world. The last verse here says you were created to do good works. You are God's handiwork. You're God, God, God created you. Those are, those are words that, that imply changing, making, constructing something show you two illustrations here that are in the sanctuary about making things. The cross back here was made by a man in our church, Frank Butler, right? That cross was labored over. It was loved as it was being built. This pulpit here was Max Murphy, who's no longer with us. He's with the Lord now. But Max put so much love and time and attention into this. And both of these things reflect the faith, the character of the men that built them. In fact, they're a testimony to their faith. There's a continuing testimony that they loved God and they built something for God. You are a testimony of what God has done in your life that God has created you out of his love, out of his grace. He, he put his attention towards you and said, I love you. I love you. I love you and you. And now you're mine. I'm the one who made you. I made you special. And now you're, how close are you to the Lord? If you're in Christ, seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father, are you a million miles away? You're right there with him. The opportunity is to be that close to him. Now, what kind of good works were you created to do? If you were created by the mercy and grace and love and kindness of God, then your good works should reflect the newness that's in you. They should reflect mercy and grace, love, kindness, all of those things. 
just to clarify the difference between mercy and grace, mercy is when there's a punishment that's deserved, and that punishment is withheld. It's not giving someone the punishment they deserve. Grace, on the other hand, is similar but a little bit different. Grace is giving something that they, giving someone something that they don't deserve, a blessing, a bonus, something better than they actually deserved. So mercy is not giving, and grace is giving towards that person. Okay. So what would a mercy good work be? Not giving someone the punishment that you think that they deserve in a situation. Well, let's say that you're in a situation where you think, and it, it could be very legitimate. It's not, I'm not just saying you're making this up. But where you think that someone has offended you, what would mercy be in that situation? Mercy would be not lashing out at them with words of anger. Mercy would not be gossiping about them in the lunchroom or wherever, on the phone or emails or whatever. Mercy would be being very careful in your language when you're talking to that person or maybe about that situation with some other people. Mercy would be trying to understand why that person did what they did, why they reacted in that certain way. And, and don't ever say, there's no excuse for what they did for me, or did to me. There's no excuse for that at all. Because maybe there is. And you're so busy thinking about the hurt that you've got, or thinking about yourself, that you're not empathetic at all about them, or with them. And so you're not giving mercy at all. But God has given you mercy. God is a God of mercy. Because God is that way and God has done that for you, you should do that to other people if you are truly his son or daughter. Also, why should he show mercy? Because there might be an evil around that situation, or maybe that is the person who offended you. There might be a non-believer who's looking at you and their eternal future is impacted by your response to this situation. If you show an unnatural mercy towards this person who's offended you, that might make a positive impression on that non-believer. But if you're offended and you just wah on that person, Is that going to help that non-believer into the kingdom? Probably not. People are watching you, and it makes a difference what you do. All right, grace. What would grace look like in that situation? Where it's not just withholding the wrath, but giving a blessing in a situation where you're offended. Showing grace would include forgiving them even before they ask. Even before they ask, because they might never ask. And if you wait to forgive them until they come down, come to you and get on their knees and grovel and whatever you want them to do, you're going to be holding on to that for years, decades maybe, until they wake up and realize maybe they've offended you. You can't let them hold your heart hostage. You can't let them have power over your emotional and your spiritual life by holding that grudge for so long. You need to release that. You need to forgive them. Besides, when did God make his forgiveness available to you? Did God until you were ready to ask for forgiveness to, oh yeah, well I better put Jesus on the cross now. No. Jesus went to the cross for everyone's sin who lived before him, who was living then, who was lived afterwards. That is available to anyone who would ask for forgiveness. Grace is forgiving people. Reaching out to them would be grace. Maybe saying something like, I know we have a difference of opinion on fill in the blank. 
But I want you to know that you are important to me as a person. And this issue that we have in between us is not as important as you are. And so I want to make sure that our relationship is, is, is above this issue or, or whatever that, that thing is. Because I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose the thing we have in common or that are good in between us. Or, that's grace to go to a person. How Do you have to be strong or do you have to be weak in order to do that? You have to be pretty strong. You have to be pretty comfortable with your relationship with God and, and vulnerable to them because they might say, you know what, Meh. no, you are out of my life forever, you're dead to me, etc., etc. The anger might still be there with them. But grace is offering to them, reaching out to them. Why? Because you received grace from God, show grace to someone else. Be like God in that situation. Again, maybe that person's not a believer, or there's a non-believer who's seeing that situation. They know both sides, and, and if they see you reacting with grace, that's different. That's not how the world works. It might wake something up. And God looks at them with grace, by the way. God looks at them, reaching out to them with grace and mercy. Whatever it is they've done to you, and are you going to get in the way of that? Are you going to say, no, God, you can't show them grace because I'm mad at them? I hope you don't put yourself in that situation. You should be an agent of grace, an agent of mercy, a conduit. In the passage, it talks about the people of this world live in a spirit. There's a spirit in the air, a spirit of rebellion against God. That is not the spirit that you should be following now. The spirit that you should be following now is the Holy Spirit. The spirit of God that should be in you, is in you, if you're a believer, that should be fully dwelling in you, that should be working in you, changing, moving you and shaping and transforming you into what God wants you to be. That's the spirit that you should be following. The spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the world that you should live in. Whether you're living in Texas or Pennsylvania or or Florida or, or Mexico, that's the world that you should be living in. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you have made that bridge available to us. You've made your grace available to us through Jesus. We thank you that we don't have to live in the old ways, in the old world, but we can live full of the Spirit and with our eyes on you and and moving forward with you. Lord, I, I pray that you would show us over and over again the difference that we can make in this world by by being people of mercy, grace, and even the kindness and love as we're in this passage. Help us to reflect your character in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.